I am with a very special guest and very, uh, I'm very humble and honored to have Mover here with us. He's a firefighter, pilot, helicopter pilot, cop, author, and race car driver. Mover, thank you. Thank you for coming. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward to chatting. I have so many questions in my mind, but let's, let's start <laughs> with, let, let's start with, with, uh, let's say you open book, like a prologue. Uh, pro who is mover? I don't even know half the time. You know, it's funny. I'm not used to being on this side of the the conversation, right? I'm usually asking people, you know, I don't, I don't, if you ask me that 10, 15 years ago, it's, you know, I'm a fighter pilot. That's it. You know, I, I, I fly jets and that's my identity. I think I, as I've gotten older, I've realized that that's a one dimensional thing and that's not, it's, it's what I've done, but it's not who I am. You know, I, I, I try to be somebody with a, you know, backbone and a strong moral compass wherever I can, you know, and, and look at all sides of the picture, try to help people where I can, try to make the world a better place, you know, kind of leave it better than I, I got it, you know, when I showed up on this earth. I've been fortunate to have some really cool opportunities and really cool things I've been able to do with, you know, flying jets or flying helicopters or, you know, all the stuff you talked about in the intro. Lately, you know, I, I've done some good work. You can kind of see the picture behind me of uh, Luna and the the therapy canine, you know, a volunteer with the sheriff's office. We've done some some awesome stuff with that. And that's been, you know, pretty rewarding. But, you know, now it's 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 about sharing that experience with others through YouTube and our podcast and stuff. And, and, and again, not just the flying part, but everything, you know, everything, everything that seems interesting to me, I try to share with people because I'm like, look, it's cool. Maybe you think it's cool. Maybe it's not. And, and try to help people where I can to get into the same thing and, and experience the same stuff. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. We, I always love your, your point of view of things like, you give you give yourself like the very first hand perspective of of things, and I, and I really appreciate that. And I already enjoy your videos. To be honest, it's very fun to watch. You and Gunky always have a good input on on stuff and and uh, different perspective. You know, a lot of people don't tend to see honest reviews on movies like movies ruined, yeah, uh, <laughs> movies. So it, it is fun to watch. About talk it. Let's talk about your books. You have you have written over twelve books so far, I believe. Yeah, something like all your Spectre series. Yeah. Where that, where that, where that passion for writing uh, was born? You know, a lot of stuff comes from loss. I was, you know, I was always a creative type as a kid, and when my mom died, I was 12 years old, and I wrote as an outlet. I actually wrote my, I call it the first book. It was like a novella. It had just under 40,000 words, which I think is like the cutoff for what a novel actually is or used to be. And I wrote that book. And it was kind of like a, you know, when you're a kid, even as a preteen or a teenager, loss happens and it's very hard to wrap your mind around it. It's hard to create a villain, right? My mom died of an aneurysm. You know, who's the villain in that story? You know, how do you, how do you create that? Well, when you're a creative, you know, you, you, you build that, you build that, that villain, you build that storyline, you want to blame somebody. And I created a fictional story that, you know, wasn't really related to that, but it was a good outlet. And every morning I'd write it, every night I'd write a chapter and every morning I'd print it out, like literally print it out and leave it for my dad while he would drink his coffee. And, you know, he'd read it, we'd talk about it and, you know, he would, he would encourage me. I tried to get it published. I sent it out to an, like one agent, like one, I, you know, this is back in the AOL days. I found one agent. They said, nah, that's, this is not good. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm not a writer. And so, you know, I, I would do creative stuff in college or whatever, but I never really wrote again. And when I was flying F-16s, I had a, a fiance who started writing. She, that was her thing. She wanted to write a fictional story. She was an F-16 pilot and she wanted to write a fictional story about F-16s. And so she's sitting there writing and I had just gotten back from a deployment. And I'm like, oh, and she'd gotten me into Vince Flynn novels because I wasn't really much of a reader until that point. And so I was like, you know, I could, I could probably try my hand at this. And so we're sitting on the couch and she's writing her chapters and writing mine. And I wrote five chapters and we broke up and 
you know, life happens and I ended up moving to New Orleans. And then when I moved to New Orleans to fly the Hornet, I had a time period of about a month where I just had no job, nothing. I'm like, I'm going to, you know, continue this novel. I don't have anything better to do. And my friend, Doug, who is kind of my editor and, you know, he's a producer on the show now and, you know, a good friend of mine, he kind of took the place of my dad because, you know, my dad had, had passed away and, well, at this time he hadn't yet, but he kind of was there reading the chapters and stuff. And he's like, hey, as long as you don't lose it in the third act, you're good. And I was like, okay, you know, because that's his response. You know, it depends on how it was written. And so I, I wrote that first book and spent a whole lot of time editing and then sent it out to publishers. Same thing. You know, I, I sent it out to four or five this time instead of one. And the response I got back was thanks, but no thanks because the publishing industry is such a gatekeeper. You know, they want, they want to be the ones that control the content, control the narrative, just like traditional media versus YouTube. And I didn't have the patience for it. You know, I was like, no, this book is, you know, this, this needs to be out there. This needs to be out there. So I self-published, I self-published and I'm glad I did because, you know, that my dad, so I, I wrote that book and published it in September of 2013. And my dad died not too long after November of 2013. And so the next book I wrote, I used that loss to, to feed into that book. And then the next book. And and so it became like this outlet for me. And it was interesting to see the reviews and interact with people and get the feedback and, you know, talk to people about the characters and stuff. That, that was what made it so fulfilling and rewarding was be able to write a book and then get the feedback and, you know, talk about the characters and stuff, which is, is such a great rewarding part of the process in general is just, you know, getting that feedback and that, that, just that, just that kind of cause effect, you know, you write something, somebody says something, you write something, somebody says something. Now you try not to read the nasty negative comments, but they exist. You know, people will tell you, I remember my first one star review on Goodreads and it said, it, it actually gives you a warning. It's like, do not respond to this. This is your first one star review. Like it's got this automated thing that tells you don't respond to your, you know, your critics because it just looks bad. And, uh, you know, I, I don't even read reviews now, you know, now at this point, I don't, I've, I've, I've got 12 books and I think I've read, you know, a handful of the reviews. I just look at the star rating. I'm like, okay, well it's over 4.5. You know, that's probably pretty good. So, but it's been a, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. It's been fun. I just finished writing my first sci-fi book and, uh, we're working on the sequel to that. I haven't published it yet. I haven't decided if I'm going to self-publish like the others or traditionally publish, but it's been a, it's been a fun thing to do. It's been very, very rewarding and fulfilling. Can you give us a little preview on that book that you, the sci-fi book, can you give us just a little hint of a, <laughs> just, just yeah, a hint? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not much. Yeah. So I started thinking about, let's see how I can say this. So I always write what I know, right? So there's two main characters and one is a, an F-16 pilot. She's a, she's an F-16 pilot named Luna, which is named after. Luna. And then that's uh, her call sign. And then there's a sheriff's deputy helicopter pilot named Dusty. And so those are our, our two main characters. And they're brought together by, let's call it a mysterious object that enters the Gulf of Mexico, airspace in Gulf of Mexico. And I wanted to do something that was you know, the, the world building sci-fi stuff that you see, cause I'm a big fan of the expanse. I'm a big fan of uh, man in the high castle, which talks about, you know, alternate realities and stuff like that. And I'm a big fan of, of some of these space opera style stuff, but I wanted to start with, you know, what happens for first contact on to, you know, let's do this. And the, the end goal, I think, and this is probably the biggest spoiler of all is I want to make a space version of like Airwolf. You know, I want to have this space wolf kind of concept where you, okay. you have you have at the and that's not book one, two or three. We're talking like if this goes the distance, you know, I want to have that kind of concept long term. But the initial part is just, you know, a fighter pilot or a cop's perspective, because you're, you're looking at it from two different characters on that first. We've got this object kind of like you remember the the 
the UFO hearings we had last year where they were looking at the objects and I even did a video on them. Stuff like that where, you know, how do we react to something that we don't know what it is and then we find out what it is and we still don't have any idea what to do with it. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. kind of the idea. And then just the adventure after that, you know, exploring. I also, excuse me, from, you know, video game perspective, I was a big fan of Mass Effect. Do you ever play that? you ever do any gaming or yeah. anything like that, Mass Effect? Yeah. One, I guess one of the inspirations, I guess, and one of the things I've always thought was cool in concept was dead civilizations. In Mass Effect, the first one, at the end of the game or towards the end of the game, you walk through this this dead planet, you know, this dead, you know, you don't know what killed them. You don't know what happened. You just, you see the artifacts, you see the remnants, you see all this stuff and you're kind of, there's this virtual AI that's kind of walking you through stuff. And I thought that was just such a cool idea. And so for me, it's about taking that from the perspective of somebody who is not a spacefaring civilization, you know, not somebody in 2150 or 2250 or hundreds of years down the road, but what would somebody today, what would Mover think seeing that for the first time? And how would we, we try to harness such technologies? Would we be afraid of it? Would we move on? You know, all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's an interesting idea to me. Uh, I don't know if it's any good. We'll see. But I, I just wanted to do something different and, and branch out. That that sounds for me it sounds sounds cool. So I like all that traveling, yeah, up to space and uh, yeah, timeline continuum, all this stuff. I like. I'm into this. Yeah, and and the thing I I my twist on it, I guess, is I write. You know, if you've read any of the other books, I'm I'm big on action, short chapters, you know, plot twists, and the conspiracy thriller side of stuff. So that's in there too. So it's like taking a space thing and going, okay, we've got this big overarching problem, but we've also got the conspiracies, the, you know, the, the different factions trying to fight each other, the threats from the spies and all that stuff. So that's all in there too. It's like taking a specter novel and put it in space and that's, right. but new characters, you know, none of the characters transfer over, which has kind of annoyed people because I've been working on that at the expense of, I left the last Shepherd book on this big cliffhanger. And so, you know, people, what, what do you mean? You know, the, the pro, the epilogue was, it had this big thing and, and where is that? And I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> One day, maybe. Yeah. People, people like uh, multiverse and yeah. 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 And that's, so, that, that's new. That's new now. It's like different universe and yeah, everything's colliding. It's like every story is colliding now. Well, that, so. and that's, that's what I did with, with Alex Shepard, because I wrote Alex Shepard as a reattack on the idea of publishing. Cause I was like, cause as I went down this publishing journey, you know, I self published first couple books and I'm like, Hey, maybe I'll try this, this traditional publishing thing to see if that's a better way as before I had YouTube and all that. And they were like, it's like a scarlet letter. If you self publish a publisher won't touch it. They won't touch what's self-published, or at least this is what they were telling me. I'm not sure that's even true anymore. And so I was like, well, I'm going to write something that's legit. Day one, day zero, you know, no, doesn't have any relationship to the other books. It's just its own thing. And I wrote that one, Ale uh, the Alex Shepard series, Absolute Vengeance, because I was in the field training program as a cop, just started, just finished the academy and all that stuff. And I had these ideas that were related to it i'm like well what if you know because that's what writing is writing is is you take you know something that might be 10 percent true and then you what if it out into you know the the fantastic and that's what i did you know i took a, a scenario that i had when i was in the field training program where i was riding with my fto i was maybe phase one and we got a call that a local school there was somebody out there shooting guns like near the school and he called 911. He actually called 911 and said that he was tired of the goblins and ghouls and ghosts and he was shooting at. Them. And so, you know, we all butt over there, uh, lights and sirens, get to the school, lock the school down. We're posted up. And then the guy takes off and they're pinging his phone to try to find him. And I remember my FTO is like, I'm driving, you know, whatever. We're running code to with lights and siren to where we think he is. And I just remember sitting in the pastor's seat going, holy crap, this is like a movie. 
this doesn't even feel real because, you know, we're on the interstate, two, two 18 wheelers side by side. Our two units are going around on both shoulders to get around these cars with, you know, 100 miles an hour to try to get this guy. And that became kind of the the basis for it. Cause I was like, man, what's the most horrific thing you can think of of a terror attack? And I said, it would involve school threat. It would involve something with the, with schools and school buses and stuff. And at the time, the whole Syria, um, ISIS thing was kind of prevalent in the news. And I said, well, if you couldn't get revenge on the people that did it, what would be the next best thing? And that was, you'd go, you'd go there, you'd go want to fight. And the idea with that book was you show up and you realize that you can't win a forever war. You know, you, there's no vengeance when you are fighting, you know, an, a concept, an idea. It's one thing if you're fighting a person and you can put a name to it. But if you're fighting an, an idea, which is what terrorism is, mm-hmm. you know, you, you cut off the head, 10 more pop up. You know, it's, it, 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 it never ends. That's what Alex Shepard was. It was that idea from the cop stuff and then taking a cop, throwing him in the Middle East. And then he gets there and he realizes that these people are, are, are also losing their families, you know, cause he thinks he's the only one, right? He loses his family and his daughter in a terror attack and then goes to the Middle East and holy crap. Well, guess what? So have they, you know, you're not, you're not the entitled American that you think you are because these people have been fighting this war for, for hundreds of years. So. And that's why it even starts, you know, before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig, dig two graves. And uh, it wasn't until I published it that that book fed into the beggar series because then because then I self-published it. And then I was like, OK, well, I'll make a, a Spectre series book that ties into it. And then now all the characters kind of mishmash together. So long answer for your short question. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. I'll let you talk. I'm like, I'm yeah. getting more, I'm getting more insight that people usually get on your books. Now that you mentioned a cop, how you became from a fire pilot, you know, yeah. RJ pilot to a cop, how, how that blends in? For a while, I was doing both at the same time. Uh, so let's see. When I was in Homestead, when I was flying, you know where Homestead is, right? South of Miami. I was mm-hmm. flying F-16s. One of the fighter pilots, we got back from Iraq. And, you know, I was the guy in Iraq that would carry too many rounds of ammo because I was like, if I jump out, dude, I'm shooting until I die. You know, I'm not getting captured. You know, this is it. And I had a friend in the squadron who was an older guy. I was a lieutenant. He's a lieutenant colonel. And he's like, you need to come do a Krav Maga. I was like, what is that? And I had read about it a little bit just in some of the Vince Flynn books and some other stuff. And I was like, man, that's a that's a cool idea. So he takes me to this place in Miami and it's like this guy's, it's his house. This is garage. And he's an old Israeli that, you know, fought in the six day war and he got in a helicopter crash, partially paralyzed, got himself back walking again, competed in the Olympics uh, with karate, trained Krav Maga under I mean, Lichtenfeld and some of the founders of Krav Maga. And he taught this, you know, and he had all these cool sayings, you know, the more you sweating here, the less you bleed in the street, you know, all this stuff, avoid, negotiate, kill, which became the idea for, for my second book. You know, this is the tenets of Krav Maga. And I really enjoyed it. Like I loved it. I thought it was, you know, I was like, it's, it's, it's great because for me it was practical. It wasn't just, you know, judo chop, you know, it was like, here's how you disarm somebody. Here's how you do this with a edged weapon, stuff like that. And so I went through, got my brown belt, became an instructor. And one Christmas I came home, you know, I'm originally from Louisiana and I taught a police department and went well, you know, I was really cool. So fast forward to, I've moved back to New Orleans or I'm flying Hornets in New Orleans and I just written the book and I'm starting to think, I'm like, you know, it's great that I'm doing all this stuff, but I need to give back. You know, I, I need to do something more than just you know, I need some kind of volunteer work. You know, I don't want to go pick up cans on the street. You know, I don't want to do that. I was like, I'll volunteer to teach the cops here how Krav Maga. Like, I'll, I'll volunteer to be an instructor. So I call up one day and I call HR and I say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an instructor in this. I'm thinking, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to teach. You know, I'd love to help you guys. And of course, you call HR and they like does not compute. You know, it it becomes the, well, if you want to volunteer, you have to become a reserve deputy. Reserve deputy. What's that? 
They're like, well, you know, you go through this academy, it's at night, you know, it takes six months to get through and you become a, a deputy. I'm like, and at the time, there was a little bit of thrash going on with the Navy and, you know, just stuff in general. And I was kind of debating what, I, what I'd wanted to do because I actually, when I was at Homestead, I went through almost the entire process. Well, I, I did. I got a con conditional job offer from the FBI because I went through the FBI special agent hiring process and got an offer. And because I, after reading those books and doing all that stuff, I'm like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything from the air. Like, I want to go kick in the door. You know, I want to be somebody, you know, I want to be the, the mid trap. You know, I want to be the action hero. And the only reason I didn't do that is because they said you couldn't fly and do that at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, that's a hard one to give up. So I, uh, when I, when they mentioned the reserve Academy, I'm like, you know, that's a be fun to try, you know, let me go do that. And so that was it. You know, I, I went to the Academy. It, it took a while because of, you know, they didn't have enough people to make an Academy. So it took about three more months before they actually could fill the class. And it happened right after I lost my dad. And so it was one of those things that I credit with keeping me afloat because I needed something to keep going forward. And unfortunately or fortunately, you know, it was kind of at the detriment to my Hornet uh, career in some ways because, you know, I was missing social functions with the squadron and stuff because I would go to class Tuesdays and Thursdays and every other weekend. Well, you know, the squadron is like, well, we, we got this event you got to go to. And I'm like, yeah, I can't. I've got class, you know, and they didn't understand it either. You know, they were like, what are you? Why? You know, you're doing this for free. You're not getting any pay for it. And so, but I did it and turns out I really enjoyed it. You know, it was one of those things that I liked. I liked the lights and the sirens and the, you know, helping people and the, the adrenaline from, you know, there's a, when you fly fighters, People always ask me, they're like, what is the biggest adrenaline rush you can do? And I was like, a traffic stop. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Why don't I fly fighters? And it's like, because when I fly fighters, the only time I ever get any adrenaline is if something's going wrong. Like something is like on fire. There's, uh, you know, I'm about to jump out. Something's going terribly wrong. Even BFM, you don't get an adrenaline rush. You know, it's, it's, it's very procedural. It's just physical. In law enforcement, any encounter could be the last encounter. You know, you just don't know. And so, you know, every traffic stop is, you know, you're, you're on your toes and you're looking and you're, you know, your, your heart rate goes up and that, that adrenaline just kind of gets up just a little bit. I mean, go over time, you know, you do enough of them, but those, those first couple, and then there was that other piece, which is, you know, it's almost like this, I don't know, Zen, this cathartic Zen where you're, you're going to a call that you know is dangerous, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's all you're focused on is getting there. Lights, sirens, getting there and stuff. And there's just something to be said about that that I always thought was, I mean, it's just different. And I, I can see why people never want to give it up because, you know, if you're doing it for the right reasons and you're doing it because you want to help people, it is, you know, they always say it's the greatest show on earth. It's the people that do it for the wrong reasons that I think have no business being there and, you know, need to move on. Yeah. It, it reminds me, uh, now that you talk about sirens and chase and a uh, traffic stop, it reminds me cops, you know, it became really famous, a uh, series for some, for almost over a decade. Still is. Uh, it's back on it's now. Still, yeah. Yeah. They're back, back they, on. they just came back on. Yeah. So it is, it, I, I talked to a lot of police officers. They tell me the same thing. It's, it's, it's basically 24 uh, seven yeah. adrenaline, every call, whatever it could be. They told me it could be a quiet night. Yeah. And that, that call over the radio changed everything. You know I mean? It's, it's game on from there. Yeah. Don't ever say quiet though. They'll never, if they say quiet, that, <laughs> that'll, that's jinxing it 100%. But it, it right. is, and, and you get, you know, I mean, yeah, you get cool stories, but to me, you know, I posted this on, on Facebook the other day, because one of the things I did after you know, it seems like everything I do in my life is after some big loss. Of, you know, I lost my, my two dogs that I had for 14 years last year. And what we did was we did the therapy dog certification. National Police Association sponsored our training. And Luna and I went and got certified. We're the first therapy canine team in the, in the state for law enforcement. And not too long ago, I was out on patrol with her because I take her out with me because it's such a new program. We're still trying to figure out exactly where she fits in. And one of the guys in the shift calls me. He's like, hey, I'm out with this 
with this flag down. Somebody flagged him down at a gas station and said, hey, my mom, we haven't heard from her all day. We see these transactions at random places. We think that's where she is, but she's elderly. She's 75 years old. Can you go find her and check on her? He calls me. He's like, hey, are you still on you know, this side of town? And I said, yeah. He's like, hey, can you go to this gas station and you know, see if you can make contact with her? So I go out and I see the car that matches the description leaving the gas station. So I catch up with her, you know, lights, turn the lights on, do a traffic stop. And I get out and she is just like bawling. I mean, this, this poor older lady is just having the worst day of her life. And what had happened was she was going to a shoe store and waiting for it to open. And she's on her phone and Pandora is giving her trouble. And she's like, I'm just going to dis disable Pandora. I don't like this anymore. And it won't work. So she Googles the customer service for Apple, for Apple Care. The first number she finds happens to be the scammer's phone number. She calls and they say, yes, ma'am, it looks like your account's been hacked, but we can fix it. We just need you to go to these places and buy gift cards and give us the gift cards and we'll refund your account. So she had been, by the time I had gotten to her, she'd been doing this for over seven hours. She had lost $11,000 and she was completely distraught. She hadn't been able to go to the bathroom. They were telling her, don't call your family or else it's going to get worse. They put a key logger. They made her download this key logger onto her phone. And she was just completely distraught. And, you know, I'm talking to her and as she's starting to realize she's been scammed, because I'm like, no, ma'am, that's not normal. You know, no, ma'am, that's not good. She goes, I said, look, um, you're not okay to drive. You know, why don't you put the car in park? I said, do you like dogs? And she's like, yeah, I was on the way, you know, to go get my dogs. I said, do you want to pet mine? You know, I got a therapy canine in the back. You want to pet her? And she's like, oh, yeah, I'd love that. So I get her out while I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do and open the door. She starts petting Luna and her just demeanor just flips. She goes from like completely distraught, completely like his, almost hysterical to just calm. And she realizes it's bad, but now the world's not ending anymore. And I said, Hey, do you think you can drive now? And she's like, Oh yeah, I can, I can drive. I said, tell you what, go back home. Call us back. We'll worry about the other stuff. I just want you to be safe, you know, because I was going to follow her home, but she had to go pick up her dogs at the vet and, you know, that wasn't going to work. And she's like, okay. So for me, and that was the first criminal patrol usage of Luna, like ever. And for me, you know, being able to be there for somebody on their worst day and make it just a little bit better is what, what makes the difference. It's what's worth it. You know, that to me is that, that change, that you know, people ask me why I do it because they're like, well, I mean, you do it for free. Why would you, why would you do that? And it's like, well, for moments like that, for, for the ability to be there for somebody. Because to me, if you have the ability to help somebody, I think you have a moral obligation to at least try. Now, if you're in a position, if you're, you have abilities and stuff and you're not going out there and using that for the greater good or for other people, then I think you're being a little selfish and, and trying to keep that to yourself. So if there's, you know, just one way I can do it and, you know, teach their own. Some people do soup kitchens. Some people do, you know, clothing donations, work at animal shelters or whatever. This just happens to be the way that I have found to be able to give back. And uh, it's something I enjoy immensely. I don't feel like I'm giving anything up to go do it. I feel like it's, you know, it's something that's just as rewarding for me as well. That's pretty good. If it feel, feels your heart with love and, and compassion, it's that's good. I have a friend that they do haircuts. That's what he does for a living. Wow. And he goes out and, and do haircuts for homeless and, and feed them. Because, that you know, that's the way that, you know, that he knows how to give back to the community. And and he does it every every month. Wow. Yeah. He goes out and, and do target a place and go there, do haircuts and feed them. Yeah. At the same time. So that's yeah. pretty good. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything major. You know, if it's just right. something to See me, it's, 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 it's combining something that you think is enjoyable with something that can help somebody else, you know, I mean, and that's whatever it is. It doesn't, there, there's no right answer. Just, you know, just don't, don't be in your shell, you know, don't, don't keep your talents to yourself. You can do it from home too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff people can do and volunteer to do all the time to help others. So that, that's the only reason I think is it's worth it. Now we jump into how you became a helicopter pilot. Cause that's like, when I saw you, I was like, okay, he's, uh, he was a cop and a fire pilot. 
Now yeah. he become a helicopter. And I, and I seen your yeah. your videos on on do you know on your on your journey. Yeah. So for those who are listening or watching, I will link everything down below so you can see the videos. Tell me how 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 you thought about hey, I will become a helicopter pilot for Airwolf. Yeah, it's easy. It's Airwolf. Airwolf. Uh, Airwolf. <laughs> so <laughs> Top Gun, now Airwolf. Airwolf, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I watched Airwolf before I watched Top Gun. You know, I didn't watch Top Gun until oh, really? I was a teenager. So, you know, it's funny. A lot of things happened in that summer of 2013. You know, I'm writing my book, but I'm also, I was watching, I think Airwolf was on Netflix at the time or one of the streaming services or whatever. And I was sitting there watching it going, well, I'd, I'd like to fly helicopters. And I was also watching this show called, uh, man, it was on his, Nat Geo with the, with the, the combat search and rescue. In fact, I think that's what it was called. Combat search and rescue or something like that. It was yeah. the, the Pedros out of, uh, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that. And I'm watching these guys. I'm like, Hey, I'm not doing anything with my life. Look at these guys. They're going into, you know, hot territories and stuff and, and rescuing people. And I just always liked helicopters, especially the Airwolf stuff. And I, I even looked it up at the time. I'm like, how much would it cost me? And it, it was ridiculous. It was like, you know, 40, 50 grand and no way. And I was just like, it's not going to happen. So I kind of gave up on the idea. And then 2019, I was December. I was getting my medical renewed for the airline. And I was in the doctor's office and he had this sign that said, you want to learn how to fly helicopters? You know, almost like a movie, you know, it's like you, you know, you too. And it's got this picture of this Robinson R-22 and I'm looking at this little piece of crap going, uh, uh, but I took a picture of it. I'm like, you know what? Just in case I'm gonna take a picture. And, uh, COVID happened. COVID, COVID happened just like you were talking about before the show, you know, COVID, you're kind of sitting around, you don't know what to do. And, and I was fortunate enough, the first couple months they gave them, the airline was given paid leaves. You know, it wasn't, you know, completely paid. I think it was like 50 hours a month or something, but it was still for me, single dude, no expenses. It was awesome. And I was like, I need to do something with my time. You know, I need to do something productive with, with this downtime. So I called the guy up. I'm like, Hey, I, I, are you flying? He's like, Oh yeah, I don't care about this stuff. I said, can I get my license? He's like, Oh yeah. And so I, I went out there and, uh, tried it now back it up a little bit because what sparked that interest was this channel because in 20, uh, at the end of 2018 and into 2019, I got, uh, an email, which is amazing. I mean, you'll find, you'll see, I'm sure you already see this, you know, with your channel and podcast and stuff, people reach out to you. People reach out to you because they watch what you do and then they want to share whatever it is that they're doing. So I got an email from the chief pilot at the Harrison County Sheriff's Office that said, love your channel. Do you want to come fly with us one day and do a video? Because he, he thought that was a great idea. And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd be honored to go do that. You know, I, in fact, when I first joined our sheriff's office, I wanted to go be a you know TFO or a pilot. And even when I moved from New Orleans to Homestead, or sorry, Homestead to New Orleans, I wanted to go fly for customs. You know, I'd put my app in to go fly for CBP Air and Marine. And unfortunately, because of the fiscal environment of the government at the time, they stopped taking people that weren't dual rated. Because we had a guy in my squadron that I, he was like my hero, right? Because he would fly F-16s and then he would go across the street and go fly A-stars and a Blackhawks and, you know, the Dash 8 for customs. Like he was flying both of them. And I'm like, dude, the stories he would tell, I'm like, this is like an action movie. This guy is awesome. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do that and I wanted to do it in law enforcement. But, you know, our agency here in St. Tammany, you know, they weren't looking for the pilots or like, you got to have a thousand hours, you know, it's, we can't send you to training or anything. And so I never could crack that nut. So I go with uh, Harrison County, go fly with them. And I'm like, man, this is pretty cool flying with the doors off. So, so this is a little different. And then they invite me back because I, they wanted me to interview Stephanie, who's their former Blackhawk pilot. You know, she's she's really cool. And she comes back. And she's like, you want to hover? It's like, maybe. It's like, I'm not sure. And she's like, OK, we'll try it. And I hovered the thing, you know, and I was like, God, this is awesome. It's like flying formation. It's what it reminds me of. It's, you know, it's really cool. So that 
that kind of put that in the back of my mind, like this is possible. So then at the end of that year, when I see that ad on here, you know, here's how you get, you know, here's, here's somebody renting a helicopter and an instructor. And then a couple months later, COVID happens. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go do this. You know, if I go get my license, maybe I can go fly a sheriff's office helicopter. So I got my license and, you know, you've, you've seen the drama with that. It wasn't exactly a direct route. And I couldn't use the GI Bill because nobody around here would use it. So it was either go somewhere for a couple of weeks, which I hate, stay in a hotel, which is hard for dogs, or, you know, pay out of pocket. And I, I decided, you know, driving to the airport is, is much more desirable. So it took several years to get up to my commercial. And I guess you'll be the first one I can officially say, but I'm flying now part time with, uh, with Harrison County. So I actually... Nice started flying for them part-time as well. So I haven't flown much with them yet because weather's been bad, but I'm still in the checkout phase of that. But yeah, flying the OH-58 has been cool. And um, yeah, so I actually have come full circle from they invited me out to go do a, a video to now yep, I've, I, I'm, I've got a commission with them. That's crazy. A couple of years later, you know, you went yeah. as, a, as a guest and now you are... Yep. You're part of the team. That, that's sometimes, cool. sometimes that's the way it works, man. Just being available for opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is sometimes you just, you cannot, it's four circles. Sometimes you cannot avoid that. It just, it's had to be like that. It's, it's meant to be like that. So now we are going, going back to your military. Cause I know you were a Navy pilot first. No, I, Air, you, Force. Air Force. You so I, I did, Air Force. I uh, did. Yeah. I was, a, what's up? We call them baby reserve, guard baby, reserve baby, whatever. I started in Air Force Reserve and then moved on to the Navy Reserve and then went back to the Air Force Reserve, which I'm still doing presently. Are so you still flying? No, I'm not flying. I'm, not flying I'm anymore. just a desk jockey now, just getting to the end of my career. But I mean, I guess I could still fly. I've still got aeronautical orders and current medical, but I'm currently in a non-flying position. Okay, see, how long have you been flying uh, F-16s and uh, F-18s? When when you start flying those uh, jets? So I I commissioned in 2006 and started flying the F-16 in 08, finished flying in 2012, and then started flying the F-16, F-18 right after that till 2016. Had a two-year break where I was waiting to transfer and took another desk job. And then flew T-38s from 2018 to 2022 when the squadron shut down. And then since 2022, I've been doing desk duty um, in the reserves. I will ask you one of the questions. I went to the Discord a couple of days ago and I told my friends at the uh, DCS squadron, they're like, hey, I'm going to interview Mover. Do you have any questions? And uh, nobody came up with the questions. They, 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 they throw me Silly questions. I'm like, I'm not asking was it, that. Is it the why does mover hate DCS? I keep getting that for some reason. Tim Davies started that rumor. Really? It's not, not true, by the way. That is not <laughs> true. I do not hate DCS. I don't do a lot of DCS content just because anything in VR and even iRacing is such a pain to set up, record, you know, all that stuff. It's just, it's a pain to do. It's fun to do, but I don't do it just for funsies. So I only do it if I'm making content, making a video, making something. So if not, I just, I just don't, don't do it. It's not that I have anything against, you know, any of those games or whatever. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is cool. I, I sometimes I fly. I do fly yeah. at night when I finish my editing and stuff like that. I'm mm -hmm. like jumping for, for an hour or two and it just, yeah, because you, like, it's crazy. People don't believe it. But, like, when you fly in DCS, I know it's simulator, but you forget stuff. Yeah. It is. It's like a perishable oh, yeah. skills. You, you forget stuff, you know. I didn't flew for almost some time. When I moved to Houston, I didn't flew for about eight months. And when I got into it, it, it was like. Oh, yeah. Trying Starting to over. Out. Yeah. It's not over. So, it took me months after that. So, yeah. One question that I got for you, how realistic is the uh, F-16 in real life in compared to the F-16 on DCS? I know it's, it's different blocks, but 
yeah. in general, are, are they very one to one or they're not they're not accurate? Well, the F sixteen in real life is pretty realistic. Uh it's just uh no, um yeah, that's a tough one, man. So there's stuff that's very accurate, you know, there there's stuff mm-hmm. that you're like the if you put VR on and you sit in the cockpit, you're like, man, I cannot tell that I'm not like I I find myself reaching up, wanting to hit buttons and stuff like that. Like that part, the the visuals are amazing. Systems wise, it's hard to say uh, from a avionics perspective because you know the F-16 has v- different blocks. It did, has different uh, either skews or the. Um, uh, MMC or or whatever. Like, there's so many different software packages. Like, I flew a Block 30, SKU 7, mostly. 7, 7.1. That doesn't look anything like an MMC jet. I did fly the MMC jet, uh, which is the Block 42, uh, but the version that I flew was newer than the version that's in DCS. But in DCS, a lot of their stuff comes from the Hellenic Air Force because that's open source. That's what they, you know, because you got to think DCS, you know, export control laws, ITAR, they're limited to what they can find open source, right? If I go tell like WAGS, which they're all very receptive stuff, but if I go tell WAGS, hey, dude, that's not how it works. He's going to turn around and say, okay, well, show me in the book because he can't go and just willy nilly change something without being able to point to where they got it legally and open source because nobody wants to go to jail which is a hundred percent valid. So there's that piece to it. So it, it, it's hard to compare it. There's also the point that even when I was flying the F-16, the SIM never was a hundred percent to the aircraft because you cannot simulate the variables of real life, like the bumps and the, you know, cause you're not getting enough data points in a SIM cause you need so much processing power. I was a SIM tech, by the way, I, I ran uh, I was a field engineer for Lockheed Martin uh, before I went to pilot training, and I ran an A-10 set. And, you, you know, you've got all these computers and processing and stuff like that, and it's kind of close, but it's never going to be a one-for-one. One. Like, it just, you, there's not enough processing power to do that. Is it pretty good? Absolutely. I mean, it, the the jet performs, I think, I just did Falcon BMS the other day, and I think Falcon BMS does a little bit better job of the the raw performance, like, you know, onset rate for 9Gs, holding 9Gs, you know, thrust to weight, all that stuff. I think Falcon BMS did a little bit better job of that, but the difference is, like, it's, it's, it's small. It's not like one is an arcade game and one is a simulator. It's like two simulators and one's just a little bit better than the other for that part. DCS, on the other hand, I think it does a a very good job of replicating, you know, just dogfighting stuff. Every time I've ever played it versus AI or real things, it looked like I expected it to look. You know, I, jets were what they look like at certain ranges. They were where I expected them to be, all that stuff. So it gets it pretty good, but it's not, you know, you're talking an off-the-shelf video game. You know, you're not right. talking a commercial grade simulator. And even then I go back to commercial grade simulators. Don't get it right either. You know, that's why we talk about simisms. That's why we don't like in the real world, you could practice BFM to dogfighting, basic fighter maneuvers to just practice setups, but you would never do it to replace being in the aircraft because there's stuff that I don't know because all I know is feel. And I, you lose all that when you're playing at your desk. Right. Because same thing with race cars, like I can go on a road course and do real well and, and probably get good lap times compared to somebody else in the same car. But I go on iRacing and you put me on a road course. I'm like, dude, this is terrible. I'm off the track. You know, I can't even because because I'm I live off of that seat of the pants. And when you take that away, it's now I would say DCS players are much better at it. And everybody I've seen this comment so many times. They're like, well, you should you should fight you know, growling sidewinder, you should fight this. I'm like, they'll win. I've got no doubt because somebody who only trains to a simulator and one G is going to be better than somebody that is used to 
doing the thing in real life. You know, it's like NFL versus Matt. You know, I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's two different things because I'm used to a certain behavior and I'm used to a certain feel. Like when I fly in a real airplane, I don't have to look back inside because I know what my energy state is based on, you know, G's, whether it's responding to the stick input, but it feels mushy or all that stuff. You don't get that in DCS. You don't get that in a simulator because there's no feel. You're just, you don't feel anything. And you'll see like when Gonky and I fought each other, Gonky was doing this too. You'll pull through, you know, AOA limits, you'll pull through G limits and stuff like that. Cause there's nothing, there's nothing to stop you. You know, there's no weight, there's no force to it. I found that with helicopters too in DCS is that, you know, that doesn't feel like they have any weight to them. So, you know, you don't feel like you have that inertia. You just don't, because you're not moving. And helicopter pilots, especially, it's 100% seat of the pants. Like, you know, your two-stage pull-up is based on what your butt tells you. You know, is am I, am I starting to yaw a little bit? Am I starting to pick up? Do I feel light in the seat? All that stuff is based on feels. 100% a sim guy or girl is going to, that is proficient, used to it, is going to do better. Because what are they going to do? They're going to do the instrument cross-check. They're going to do the stuff that we tell people not to do, which is they're going to stare at their airspeed. They're going to stare at, you know, AOA. They're going to, you know, look out momentarily. And a lot of them don't use VR either, which, you know, even VR, I think, simulates dogfighting better because you get that neck strain. You know, you get that, here's where I need to look. People that are using track IR, I mean, you're playing this on easy mode. Because you can look mm-hmm. between your tails, you know, you're not, you just look off a little bit, you know, it's, it's different, you know, it's, yeah. it's so it's like it's cheating. Yeah. I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's cheating because it's a video game and it doesn't matter. But right. as far as like, if you want as real as it gets, you need to be in a centrifuge. You can't be in a centrifuge, right? Because you're not going to be pulling nine G's. Okay. Well, what's the next best thing? You'd probably need a motion cockpit and VR because when you look, you know, you need that weight on your, you need that weight on your head because that is the part that that's why I have two herniated discs. You know, I have herniated discs in my neck because of pulling G's and looking around, you know, that's, it's just part of the game. So, um, cause you're not going to be doing this and leaning forward at nine G's. You can try it. I did it. It hurts. I tore two tendons in my neck doing it, but you know, is it fun? Hell yeah. The graphics look awesome. You know, is it, Flying like an F-16 for the most part, yeah, I would say so. I would say it's a, it's a fairly accurate representation. Is there some stuff that's not right? Yeah. But is there stuff that's classified that's never going to be right? Absolutely. You know, and I think people get mad about it. They get mad at me because I won't do any BVR stuff beyond visual range. I will not do anything that involves slinging missiles for any distance. And that is because it is all still classified. And I won't do yeah. it. You know, not for a right. video game. Yeah, not for any, really. not for any reason. I mean, there's no reason to. Um, and I, it's so funny because the problem I have is the community can be very, very toxic. You know, and 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 instead of saying, "Hey, dude, you're a subject matter expert. You've done this in real life. What do you think?" They will tell you you're wrong. And it's like, well, why'd you ask? You know, why even show up if you're just going to sit there and tell me that I, I I'm wrong? You know, I've I've got a thousand hours. How about you? You know, right. absolutely. <laughs> Now, now that you, you're talking about classified stuff, and uh, and I, I know you hit in couple. I know we're kind of short on time, but you hit couple stuff that that I kind of relate to you about yeah. classified stuff. The war in Ukraine. I know you mentioned a couple of videos of the S16 mm-hmm. being down and stuff like that. And some some of the stuff that I seen on Ukraine is the uh, MLRS, the uh, long range artillery piece. I work in MLRS. Okay. So when they're talking about limits, I know yeah. their limits because right. you know, yeah. Right. And they're like, "Oh, they can reach about a hundred miles." I'm like, <laughs> "Sure, yeah, because it's, it's still classified, right? But, um, right." But if people don't understand, I tell you know, I tell people like, "Hey, whatever you read in the news is far from reality." Right, and that you know, that's what I found is with articles and stuff. If 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 they'll take something that you're an expert in. And get it that wrong, what else are they getting wrong? Right. Like if you if you see an article and they're saying something about, you know, this and you're like, oh, dude, that's not even close. Right. You know, what else are they getting wrong? But I the thing is, 
you know, 10 years, $10,000 is the, is the typical per offense when you talk about classified stuff. And I know this because I was a security manager, you know, I mean, I, I was responsible for this within the squad and I take it very seriously. And when it comes to a video game or a, a video and stuff, you know, it's not worth it. Like what, what difference does it make if I go out and fly BFM guns only or go do a 2V act, you know, BVR engagement? What's that going to do? Maybe a hundred thousand views. Okay. Well, that hundred thousand views is not going to pay my legal fees, court costs, bail, all that stuff and reputation. You know, you don't want to be that person that's been entrusted with your nation's secrets just for personal gain to do that. So I, you know, I mean, I try to be as careful as I can. I'm obviously not a perfect person. You know, I mean, I'm sure it's possible that I could make a mistake, but my going in game plan is to be as cognizant, careful as I possibly can. And when it comes to showing off for DCS, it's just not worth it because there's nothing to, to gain. At. And it's funny because I have seen people with their interpretations of stuff that I know is classified. I'm like, okay, well, at least they don't know that. And then it's wrong. And, you know, the, the system works, you know, we're, we're, we're adequately protecting the system and, you know, or whatever, but yeah, I, I just don't, I just don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. I, I feel, I feel your pain because if people don't, don't get it. They don't understand the, uh, the implications of, yeah, we, let's say I, I make a comment on mm -hmm. whatever, whatever channel of news and I make, you know, make a comment about the MLRS capabilities. You know, X ammunition can go X amount of this, right. whatever. That's classified. If it's classified and somebody sees it, yeah. they're going to get a knock on the door and be mm -hmm. like, hey, you reveal the classified yep. information and yep. probably I get 10, 20 years in prison for that. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. For the common folk, absolutely. For if you're a politician, you don't get anything. But if you're us, much. you and me, <laughs> we will be under the jail. <laughs> But, you yes, know, CMJ, they're yeah. going to throw, the, throw the book at us quick yeah. in a they'll, heartbeat. They will come right after us. But, you know, again, with a game like DCS, I mean, for me, it's not worth even trying because mm. there's so much stuff that you just do instinctively, have it, you know, just out of habit. And you don't want that to get out, you know, because I have seen people observing every little thing you do and they're like well hey how come he was at this speed here how come you were at this speed here you know why were you doing that here because they're very smart you know the people that do this and it may not be their fault you know it may be you know an unintentional release because i go do something in dcs and a commenter says hey i noticed you did this and that is the validation it's not so much it's it's the putting the pieces together that becomes a, an operational security nightmare so that's why it's easier just to stick with stuff that's benign, you know, that, you know, if most of the stuff I could do with a backseater that's uncleared, you know, and completely unclassed versus, you know, something like that. And we did that. I mean, when I, in the Hornet and in the, the F-16, you know, in the simulator, if you, and even when I was an A-10 uh, or A-10 sim guy, we had a cl unclassified version. Like if you had a f familiarization simulator, you would take the unclassified hard drive, put that in. It didn't have any of the weapons. It didn't simulate any of the stuff. And so if you had people coming to visit, distinguished guests or, or whatever, you put the unclassified stuff in and you, there, you weren't worried about that. Uh, and you knew not to go try it. Nobody was out practicing, you know, a 4VX or whatever, because nobody even knows to do that. You know, that's a, that's a different animal. So it's just safe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is. Hey, um, I guess we're gonna con we're gonna get this uh, conversation hopefully in Houston part two. Yeah, on yeah. Your, when so. you come down here, and now uh, we uh, hopefully we able to uh, plan and and get together again. Mover, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming forward and uh, and have this conversation with me. Hopefully, we we can fly again. We can fly on DCS just for the hell of it and do some some bum uh, bum runs with with Gunky. The Gunky. Seems like a real, real smart guy too that I would like to talk to him and uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, yeah, I can get Gonky on here. Gonky has no DCS setup though because his wife would divorce him, oh. so he is limited to uh -huh. what he can uh, borrow, which lately has okay. not been much. So he's tough to get into DCS. That's pretty good. But uh, Mover, thank you so much again. I really appreciate. It. Thank you for your service and uh, 
Yeah, and thank hopefully, you. Uh, we see each other in person uh, in the next couple of months and uh, up to the next one. Awesome. Hey, do you thank have you. any words of encouragement for those uh, guys, CNS, that that looking forward to either join the military or join the police force? Do you have any words of encouragement? Well, we always say make them tell you no, which means don't self-eliminate. Make somebody who's actually in a position of authority be the one to say no. And nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be yes. But that's it. You know, do it. Don't don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Uh, talk yourself down. Just go do it. and you'll find that the answer is going to be what you what you want. And if it's not, keep fighting until there's no one left to fight. You know, if you if you just say, oh, well, you know, I guess that's it. I wouldn't be a fighter pilot today if I had just taken no, you know, the first time around. So just keep going. Don't be your own worst enemy. That's it. Right. I appreciate Mover. And for those who are watching or listening, thank you so much. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe also. I will link everything down below for his uh, channel, for his YouTube, his webpage. Everything that you need to know about him will be listed down below. Thank you so much and I appreciate it. Goodbye. Thank you. Hold on, pause this. Thank you. Uh, let me find the mouse.